Pardon the interruption, but I'm Frank Isola. And Tony, when I got the call to be on today's show, I cleared out my entire schedule. I'm Tony Kornheiser. That's so nice of you, but weren't you just on Around the Horn? Weren't you? That was, that was an AI thing. You know, they can do that now. Oh, that wasn't computer. Wasn't really you? Oh, no. okay. A, That's good to a know. A better looking version of this. Me. <laughs> this is me. Sad to say, this is me. Welcome to PTI, <laughs> boys and girls. It's April Fool's Day, but no Will Bond means no joke this year. With me today is our great friend, Mr. Frank Isola. That's real. That's definitely real. Good cheers. That's fun. And we begin today with the men's final four, Frank. There are two number one seeds, Connecticut and Purdue. There's a four, Alabama, and an 11, North Carolina State. Frank, you watched. I watched. Whose win was the biggest news to you? All right. I, I want to say UConn in some ways because they have a 10-game winning streak in the NCAA tournament, and they've won every game by at least 13 points, and they go on a 30-0 run in that game. You don't see that, especially against an Illinois team, which was one of the best offensive teams in the country. But I'm looking at NC State, what they did to Duke. And this kid, DJ Burns, who right now for me is the face and the body of the men's NCAA tournament. He is so much fun to watch. He had 21 of his 29. And, Tony, this is a guy that you know really well, Jim Valvano. It's hard to believe it was 41 years ago. The runs are somewhat similar. Yeah. This team also had to win the ACC championship to get into the tournament. They have won nine straight elimination games in theory, and they had to be Duke twice. And here they are in the Final Four for the first time since 83. It's a little hard to believe it's been that long. Yeah, I was tempted. I am tempted to agree with you and say North Carolina State because I was truly surprised at how easily they handled Duke. But yeah. maybe I shouldn't have been. Maybe I shouldn't have been because they beat them a couple of weeks ago in the ACC tournament. Right. Their big guy, D.J. Burns, who is a load, he <laughs> dominated Filipowski. I mean, yeah. I, I think he's an NBA player down the road. And, and, you know, as you say, they're on this nine-game heater. Five of those games were against ranked teams, so maybe I shouldn't be surprised. So what I'm going to say to you is the biggest news was Purdue because Purdue is a great story, and Purdue has yeah. earned this. Last year, Purdue was knocked out in the first round by a 16 seed when they were number one, and everybody threw them under the bus. Well, now they're about two-thirds of the way to pulling a Virginia at this point. Yeah. I will tell you, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, that the Tennessee-Purdue game was the best game on the board. And Connect yeah. and Edie did everything that we expected them to do in a big game. Connect, I think, had either 36 or 37 and Edie had 40 and 16. And people need to stop talking about what he might not be able to do in the pros. That's right. And concentrate on how great he is as a college player. And I will amplify what you said about Connecticut because I'm sorry Will Bond's not here. He skipped town because he doesn't want to defend <laughs> his pick of Illinois to win That's the right. entire tournament. And they spit yeah. the bit. 30 yeah. to nothing. They're a three seed. 30 to nothing. That's, that's obliteration, Holmes. I mean, yep. honestly. And, and Shannon, who Wilbon says is the best player in America, right. I think he went two for 12. Two for and 12. He and he had eight points. But if I had to pick the real news, I, I think if I was writing a column, my column would be Purdue because I, I, it feels like a certain amount of vindication to me. Yeah, and, and, Tony, it feels like it, it's hard to believe that they haven't made the Final Four since 1980. That's the year after. No. Bird and Magic. That's how long it's been. You know, you mentioned Tennessee, but think about this. In that game, the fouls were 20, 25 to 12. Zach Eady drew 16 fouls, was called for one. How upset do you think Tennessee is after that game last night? Uh, yeah, but, but they got beat by a worthy team. Purdue's a yeah. worthy team, and so was Tennessee. Yeah. You're right about that. All right. Now to the women's tournament. Unbeaten South Carolina is into its fourth consecutive Final Four with a win over Oregon State. NC State joins them after upsetting one seed Texas. And tonight, we've got Caitlin Clark in Iowa taking on Angel Reese in LSU early with Juju Watkins in USC facing Paige Beckers in UConn late. Tony, would you like to start with yesterday's results or tonight's matchups? Frank, I'm going to leave yesterday all to you whenever you want right. to deal with it, with the <laughs> exception of two small comments, which is that South Carolina proves its worth every time it goes out there. I that's mean, right. that's a really good team. And that it's very cool 
that NC State has both its men's and its women's teams in the Final Four. But tonight, tonight is the main event. Everybody wants to see Iowa against LSU. Everybody wants to see Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. Everybody wants to see how they will react to each other on the court. Because if you remember last year when LSU was winning and time was running out, Angel Reese was taunting Caitlin Clark. I think this is the game. I think this could be the highest rated women's game of all time. I mean, I, I, I believe that. I think LSU is the better team. Um, Iowa, I watched them a bunch. They don't really play any defense. They're just out there to outscore you. <laughs> and LSU is, is the defending champion. And while I understand that the coach of LSU has a vendetta against newspaper stories, which is bad for you and me, considering yep. what we did most of our lives, she also has national championships as a coach at two different schools. Yeah. I believe she has a championship as a, as a player at a third school. To underrate her or discount her is tremendously foolish. She is a great basketball coach. I, would, I will find myself rooting for Iowa because I think it's a better story, but I expect LSU to win. Yeah, and Kim Mulkey loves the us-against-the-world mentality. And then her players yesterday, all they were doing was throwing bouquets at the feet of Caitlin Clark. They weren't going to, you know, get nasty. One quick thing about uh, NC State, not ranked in the top 25 when the season started they're in, and obviously South Carolina. For an unbeaten team, it, it seems like we don't talk about them a lot, maybe because these other games that you're mentioning, we're talking about the star players. I get it, Cardoza, their big center, is an excellent player, but the star of the team is still the coach. It's like old-school college basketball where we talk about the coaches all the time. But here's the thing about tonight's LSU-Iowa game, Tony. They played almost exactly a year ago. It was April 2nd. And it was that game, the 10 million people watched it. But you mentioned what happened at the end of the game. So, Tony, we've been talking about these two teams and Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark for a year now. We don't do that anymore in the men's tournament because the guys come and go. Everyone leaves. It's like an actual rivalry. And then in the nightcap, you're getting Paige Beckers, who, remember, two years ago, she was better than Caitlin Clark. She was the, uh, you know, right. the flavor of the month. Right. And now you get this great player, Juju Watkins, the star power for the women's game. It's amazing. This could be one of the best nights in the history of the women's tournament. The, the word you use, star power, is 100% true. Gino Auriemma will tell you, because he said it out loud, that Paige Beckers is the best player in America. Juju yeah. Watkins is the best freshman and maybe the best prospect in America, and they're guards. So they'll have the ball in their hands the entire game. It start, it's, this, this is America's Got Talent tonight for women's basketball. <laughs> this is it. Let's move You're to right. baseball. It's way too early to draw any conclusions about a season that has 162 games, and the Yankees have played just four. But the Yankees <laughs> won all four and beat a two-time World Series champion Houston in Houston. Juan Soto, hello, is batting 529. He had the game winner last night. He has the go-ahead RBI in three of his first four games as a Yankee. Frank, how confident should Yankee fans feel after sweeping the Astros? Yeah, fourth time since 1950 that they'll start a season 4-0. And we know all about right field at Yankee Stadium. He'll get to test it out Friday in their home opener with, you know, Paul O'Neill. And you think of Reggie Jackson, who, you know, we all know really well from his days with the Yankees. But Soto, remember, first exhibition game with the Yankees hits a home run. He has a flair for the dramatic, throwing out the runner at home in the opener this year in Houston. The game Saturday night, Tony, Marcus Stroman, think about this. He pitches into the sixth inning. He's trailing in the game. There are men on base. Aaron Boone actually lets him finish the sixth. And what happens at the top of the seventh? Oswaldo Cabrera hits the game-tying home run a couple of batters later. Juan Soto, again, that special quality. You know this. The fans are going to fall in love with this guy. They are absolutely going to love him. The start that he's off to is incredible. I had the privilege of watching Juan Soto in Washington for four-plus yep. years. I watched him help win a World Series and then I had the agony of seeing him traded for no apparent reason, as far as I'm concerned. When he was 19 and 20, the comparisons were drawn to Mel Ott. The next guy he's going to be compared to is Babe Ruth. And, yeah. and you're right. He rises to the moment. He was on base 12 times in that series. Nine yeah. hits and three walks. As you said, he threw a guy out in the opening game at home plate. And he got the game winner. He didn't get it off some rum dum who just made the squad overnight. No, he got it yeah. off arguably the best relief pitcher in the major leagues, Josh Hader. And he got him once before, Frank. He got him in the I wild remember. card game when Hader was pitching from Milwaukee, and he had That's the right. game-winning hit there. 
He is made for New York. He is made. I'm saying this living in Washington. He's made for Yankee State. The Yankees should sign him right away. They shouldn't let him get to be a free agent. But, of course, we know Scott Boris is his agent, and Scott <laughs> Boris takes you to free agency. Boris was 0 for 5 this year, I think. He's yeah. not going 0 for 6 with Soto. No. Not with Soto, no, he's, he's not. No. And, and, Tony, what about, what about the fact that you know, they, they're 4-0, I get it, but the ace of their staff is on the 60-day IL, and he might be out. <laughs> Who right. knows? It could be all season. It's still going right. to come down to pitching. We've seen the Yankees you know, ca get carried through the regular season by hitting. Eventually, it's going to come down to pitching, and I don't know if they have enough. Well, through the first four games, all they've needed is that guy Soto so far. He's amazing. Let's take a break. He's amazing. Coming up, the Spurs, they've been lousy all season. So should Victor Wembanyama really win Defensive Player of the Year? And we have to talk about a field goal in the UFL, not just for how long it was, but for who kicked it. Pretty amazing. You're right we about We probably Soto. have to talk about the UFL, too, because I never <laughs> knew it was even on. Yeah, Soto's great. <laughs> So, and, and he was not great in San Diego. He'll be great in New York. He'll Your ship. It's mail time. Our portal to the mortals. I like that phrase. Let me see what's first. Mail time. <laughs> Let me put on glasses here. Frank, do you like Victor Wembanyama's case for defensive player of the year? You know, their defense... When he's not on the court, their defensive rating, it's a lot different. I get it. The guy's sensational. I have a vote, so there's a pretty good bet he's going to win Rookie of the Year. I don't think he's going to become the first player to be Rookie of the Year and Defensive Player of the Year. My big thing is, Tony, they have 18 wins. And I get it. You want to look at stuff individually, but it's not impacting winning enough. This is an award he's going to win a lot of times, but I think right now Rudy Gobert, mm -hmm. Minnesota's got one of the best defensive teams in the league. I would still give him the nod over his fellow Frenchman, Victor Wembanyama. Yeah, I mean, my feeling about this is that it matters to others and it doesn't matter much to me. I think what we're talking about is a kid who's seven foot four and is very eager to play defense. I believe he leads the entire league in blocks, something like 286, yeah. and he's one block per game ahead of the second best guy, which is an enormous yeah. separation there. He's got he's also got like eighty five steals, and you say, How could a seven foot four guy sneak up on somebody and steal the ball? But you know this better than I. When he was drafted and anticipatory to his being drafted, people said he was going to change the game. I think we're seeing an evolution of that yeah. now, a beginning of that now. He leads all rookies in blocks, in steals, in scoring, and in rebounds. And I would ask, what else is there? I mean, you mentioned Rudy Gobert, who seems to win this every single year. <laughs> and I got no problem if he wins it again. But Victor Wembe and Rudy Gobert is a good player. Victor Wembanyama is on track to be 10 times the player Rudy Gobert is, right? Yeah. And Ten by times. the way, and Saturday night, think about this. He goes for 40 and 20. Jalen Brunson goes for 61, becomes the 37th player in NBA history to score at least 60. And after the show, I'll give you the other 36 if you'd like. That would be great. But he also lost, right? That was in a yes. losing effort, if I'm not that mistaken. One. So that matters. Yes. That You're matters. Right. Here's You're the right. next one. What's the word for the winning field goal that Jake Bates kicked to lead the Michigan Panthers over the St. Louis Battlehawks yesterday? Uh, I'm going to say Brandon Aubrey-esque, of course. That's the kicker for the Cowboys that went from Notre Dame, you know, playing soccer professionally to kicking field goals. So Bates the other day. Now, this is a guy that played soccer at Central Arkansas, then at Texas State. Then he was on the Arkansas football team, but he was only doing kickoffs. No field goals. What happened the, uh, this weekend, first field goal that he attempted since high school. He hits a 64-yarder. What do they say? No, 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 no. A timeout was called. You got to do it again. And then he made it a second time in the same stadium where Justin Tucker made a 66-yarder. Come on, for your first ever professional kick, you make a 64-yarder? Pretty impressive. So apropos of what you're saying about this kid in, in the colleges that he went to, I think there'd be a couple of coaches who would say, how stupid am I that I didn't realize that this kid should kick field goals? If you kick a 64-yard field goal in the UFL, the word is, hello, NFL. Somebody is going to sign this guy within yeah. the next week or so. I mean, because it's 64 is 64. And as you Amazing. say, Justin Tucker's the only guy with one longer, which is 66. And as you say, he made both. He made the one that they yeah. called the time on. And he made the next one, and he hadn't done it since high school. 
of equal importance to me was I had no idea the UFL had started. I, I, I was watching <laughs> other things yesterday, and I, I saw was aware commercials it. for it. <laughs> and no, I, I was completely unaware that the league had started. And I wanted to say, and I'm going to say out loud, how can you schedule against the NCAAs? Are you insane? Yeah. Nobody's going to watch your games. I mean, you had yeah. a year to figure out what the window was, and you didn't get the yeah. window. Enough there's, emails. There's football. Let's take football, one last football break. football all the time. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I say there's football well, all the time. People it never like ends. to watch it. Yep. Yeah, well, then there were no crowds in the end zones, though. Still to come. Yeah. Should Scotty Scheffler's finish make him more or less confident for the Masters? And Joel Embiid is reportedly returning this week. How careful should the Sixers be with him? By the way, the line on that field goal, both field goals, the exact same line. It crossed the bar in the exact same spot. I mean, would have made it from seven. Th this kid, what happened to, to not <laughs> kicking field goals in college? What? Wait. It wasn't good. Big Finish is brought to you by Enterprise for lives in drive. Happy time, people. Happy 36 birthdays, Brooke and Robin Lopez. The twins are currently visible and rather charming in a State Farm commercial where they are sort of kind of wrestling for the basketball in front of a pair of insurance-seeking parents who are sort of kind of upset. Brooke is the center of the Milwaukee Bucks, averaging 12.3 points, 5.3 rebounds per game. After not making a single three until his seventh season in the NBA, Brooke has developed a three-point shot. He's shooting 36% from back there. Robin is out of the league. He played on the Bucks with Brooke for 16 games this season, then was traded to Sacramento and subsequently released. The Lopez twins joined the NBA out of Stanford back in 2008, Frank. You're right about Brooke Lopez. If you want to find him, he's usually standing outside the three-point line. You know, he broke in with the Nets. And you think about all the great net players over the years, Dr. J, Super John Williamson, Rick Barry, Buck Williams, Jason Kidd. You know, Brooke Lopez is the all-time leading scorer in net franchise history. It's kind of hard to believe. Really? No, I, I never would have thought that. Never. Happy anniversary, Patrick Waugh and Chris Osgood. On this day 26 years ago, while playing for the Avalanche, Waugh, arguably the greatest goalie of all time, took part in arguably the greatest goalie fight of all time with Osgood of the Red Wings. The intense rivalry between Colorado and Detroit in the late 1990s boiled over when Waugh skated to center ice to challenge Osgood to meet him there. What followed was a stirring exchange that saw Waugh land some big rights before Osgood responded with a few of his own and wrestled Waugh to the ice. Hockey goalie fights are rare. Soccer goalie fights seem non-existent. <laughs> Frank, you are a soccer guy. Would you like to see a soccer goalie uh, fight? Well, you know, they are wearing gloves. The only thing is they're about 100 yards apart. It would take a long time. By then, momentum could die, kind of like when the pitchers come out of the bullpen. By the way, as you know, the most feared goalie in terms of fighting was the guy that won four Stanley Cups with the New York Islanders, Billy Smith. Nobody messed yeah. with him. Nobody. Tough guy. I got to watch him a lot as a kid. Happy trails to a third straight win for Scotty Scheffler. The world's number one missed a five-footer for birdie yesterday and a playoff with Steven Yeager in the Houston Open. Yeager got his first PGA Tour win in his 135th start. Scheffler had won two straight tournaments, the prestigious Players' Championship and the Arnold Palmer. The story of his hot start was his putting, which had improved noticeably since going to a mallet putter. But the putter failed him this week. He missed two short putts for a double bogey on Friday and missed the five-footer left on 18 yesterday. Still, Scheffler has been the brightest light on the PGA Tour, and he's pocketed over $9 million for two firsts and a second in his last three starts. Yeah, I know you're all over this story. He's the number one ranked player in the world. He's only won one major. That was in 22 when he won the Masters. Is he the favorite going into the tournament this week, next week? Um, well, the, the, the Masters isn't this week. The Masters is in Next two week. weeks. Yeah. Is he the favorite? He's a co-favorite. Uh, John Rahm, and it doesn't matter where John Rahm is playing around the world. Doesn't matter. John Rahm is a co-favorite for everything because John Rahm is as good as anybody in golf. I wonder, will he still have the mallet putter by then? That was Rory McIlroy's <laughs> idea to get him on a yeah. mallet putter. And he, and he was great initially and not terrible this week, but missed Putts that really would have helped him win. Let's go to the big finish if we could. Joel Embiid expected to return from his knee injury as soon as Tuesday. Is that too soon? Uh, hey, 
he's got to get out there eventually. You know, they're in eighth place. He's been out since January 30th. Remember, Tony, if they end up eighth, they could end up playing Boston in the first round, the team that knocked them out Ooh. last year. Ooh. Andy Enfield officially left USC for SMU. Does that make sense? I remember when he went to USC from Florida Gulf Coast in Dunk City. Yeah. The Georgetown people hate him, of course. Yeah, I mean, SMU's going to the ACC. That's a basketball conference. USC's yeah. going to the Big Ten football conference still. Mav snapped the Rockets' 11-game win streak. Big deal. Yeah, Luka had 47. The Rockets are two behind the Warriors. They play this week, but the Warriors have the tiebreak. It's not going to be easy. Austin Matthews notched his second 60-goal season. Are you impressed? One of eight guys of all time with two 60s. Could get 66 this year. Last one, Suns and Pelicans tonight. Is that significant? It is because the Suns sit in eighth place trying to get out. By the way, the 37 players I mentioned to score at least 60, Kevin Durant, believe it or not, yeah. is not one of them. He's not one of them. And yeah, the nope. Suns feel disappointing this year, don't they? They feel and disappointing. A little bit. We're out of time. Yeah. We'll try to do better the next time. I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Frank Isola. Thanks for watching. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. And now, here's Sports Center. Pretty good show. PTI. Thanks for being on it. Much more on PTI's bonus topic. Okay, Frank. Which team is under the most pressure tonight, LSU, Iowa, Southern Cal, or UConn? Well, Southern Cal is under the least amount of pressure because Juju Watkins is only a freshman. We think she's going to get there. If they do make it to the Final Four, though, the USC's first trip to the Final Four since Cheryl Miller in 1986. It's been a while. I think it's Iowa. They're the higher-seeded team. I get it. Uh, LSU's the defending champs. But you think about all the pressure that's going to be on Caitlin Clark. She's only got the maximum of three games left in this brilliant career of hers, and she's going to need her teammates to have a big game. She's going to have to play well. But, Tony, you know this. If and when she does lose, people are going to come crawling out of the woodwork to criticize her. See, she wasn't the best of all time. How can you say that? She didn't win a national championship. The spotlight's on her. The spotlight's on Iowa. That's why they have the most pressure. Yeah, I agree with you completely about USC. I think there's a little more pressure on Connecticut than anybody realizes yeah. because of their history, even though nothing yeah. was expected from them this year. But Paige Beckers has had such a great season that there may be some pressure there. I think where you and I differ, and, and we understand that, that the A game is LSU-Iowa. Yeah. I, the Caitlin Clark thing that you say is probably correct. But she has had the most wonderful season. And she has brought millions of people into women's basketball on television. And her future is assured. I don't think anybody has to worry about that. I, I don't know that people are saying she's the greatest player of all time. I would never make that case now, you know, even the greatest college player of all time, because I think you probably do have to win something that, that, that factors in in the way that it factors in in the NBA. But I think there's more pressure on LSU because LSU is the defending national champions. Their signature win was over Iowa last year, and they fell a little bit this year. If I'm not mistaken, they're a three yeah. seed, not a one seed. They've had discord on that team a little bit this year. And I think this is the game that validates who they are last season and this season. And so I feel there will be a little bit more internal pressure on them than there will be on Iowa. But on the pressure meter, both schools are at the very top. Very top. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're right about the A game. It was last April 2nd when they played LSU and Iowa. Ten million people watch it. Can you imagine what it's going to be like tonight? That's it. We're done. Back to you.